you got to be honest with yourself and say, is this something you think you can or something you know you can? And it takes self-awareness and it also takes, you know, sort of a thought about what do you like to do? What is what is the best and highest use of your time? Really, how do you make an argument that if you're saying, I believe that this is in the best interest of the patient, because this patient is having refractory disease, this patient has severe disease, this patient has X, Y, and Z risk factors, and I feel they need a higher level of care than I'm able to provide in this office, that becomes an argument that's hard to refute. One of the reasons why all of us in dentistry have a job is that people don't want to lose teeth. You know, teeth are still a body part. It's not just an extraction. You know, in my opinion, it's an amputation. Get ready for your unofficial dental hygiene podcast. These are the tales of two hygienists, one East Coast RDH and one West Coast guy genist. Listen as they tackle the profession of dental hygiene with humor and enthusiasm. Now, please join Michelle Strange and Andrew Johnston as they tell you a tale of two hygienists. Welcome back, everyone, to a Tale of Two Hygienists podcast, episode number 314. My name is Andrew. Uh, well, look, uh, it happened again. <laughs> I, you'd think after 314 full-length episodes plus you know hundreds of other episodes, we would have figured out this audio thing by now. Um, this is a new one for us, though. We I can't figure out what happened. So right before we went on to record this intro for the interview, uh, um, we had to switch Michelle's... Uh, microphones because she had her earbuds in, but she also had her Yeti that she was using and something happened. And she sounds like a robot who was dropped under the water. And I, I, for the life of me, can't figure it out. So I was going to just redo an intro and just do it myself. But I think, you know, it's funny. It's hilarious to me. You guys might not care, but I'm going to go ahead and play that anyway. So I hope you enjoy this intro for episode 314. And this is Michelle. Welcome to the podcast. What's up, Michelle? <laughs> I got a, I got another uh, state license. Fantastic. Wait, past Colorado? Yeah, I got one for Utah. Good for you. I'm going to collect in like infinity zones. That is the dream. Um, what about Arizona? I heard there's <laughs> reciprocity for Arizona pretty easily. Oh, I don't know that. So I that would be great. just I saw it. For New Mexico. Um, New Mexico. Well, we have our buddy, Sarah Thiel, who used to be on the board there. So we should probably ask her if there's any weirdness about that. I thought there was a local anesthesia thing that was weird there. No. Um, I'm having some issues with my local anesthesia in yeah. all states. So, yeah. um, I think I'm going to end up instead of like piecemealing it together to get all the things I need, I might just take like a little course somewhere. So yeah. yeah. It sucks that I got to do it, but also a refresher on anesthesia. Is not going to hurt so. you at all. It might be kind of fun, actually. Not going to hurt. Yeah, I made it. And I only learned to give infiltration blocks. Infiltration. Not, I know it's not really a thing, not but blocks. you know, like yeah. in the location of a block, you can infiltrate. So, you know, oopsie whoopsie, sometimes a block happens. Yeah. Well, I, I will be but, interested to hear how that goes. And if you actually do learn something about local anesthesia, or if you're like, mm, you know, I knew it. I knew it. I didn't have to do this. Yeah. I definitely think I could, uh, I will learn something or just be reminded of something. Yeah. Which would be great. Yeah. Well, yeah. Good. So good. Good. Yeah. I just got that literally before we started recording. <laughs> well, that's exciting. <laughs> Is Utah on well, your you trip though? Yeah. Um, well, it's, just north of you know colorado so i could go up there and also all the the ladies at hygiene edge are up there so i yeah. thought i'd go hang out with them maybe for a little bit mm-hmm. um but honestly the cost of these like to get a license is not that expensive but what's so stupidly expensive is that i have to get my national board sent and mm-hmm. my regional board sent and my transcript sent and then mm-hmm. the certification and i'll tell y'all one thing utah you need to get it together they wanted not only my transcript that showed that i took 
anesthesia and pass it from an accredited school, yeah. but a letter from the school wow. that said I passed. And I was like, and also test scores from my written board for anesthesia. I was like, the certification that has passed from the dental board doesn't work Not for Not good you. enough, no. I mean, I had to do the same thing down here in Florida, though, right? I had to have, uh, luckily, I have the most amazing people still working at the school that I went to, uh, but they uh-huh. had to write a letter. And um, this isn't the first time they've had to do that. They had to do it for Oregon, too. Uh, they've gone way out of their way. They didn't have to. They're not getting paid that any kind of money to deal with my nonsense, but they do. And, well, now I'm certified down That's in Florida. But all the time. It's unfortunate. Oh, it's unfortunate. America. Yeah. Killing me. Anywho, that's my news. Great. I have no news. <laughs> same old, same old. I went to work this week and it was the same as always. Another day, another year. Yep. yep. And dentistry. Well, we do have a really good episode today. And this was actually one that, and I mentioned this in the podcast episode or the interview, but um, we, when we surveyed everybody last year, everybody said they wanted more perio. We have perio fast back. But some people like these long form episodes and um, we have one of the most amazing uh, leaders mm, in the world the of Ontario mm-hmm. on um, Dr. Mia uh, Geisinger. I'm pretty sure I said that correctly <laughs> to Dr. Mia. Um, and she came on and she was, I mean, she's not only just a great educator, but she's a prolific writer and she's out there doing the work and it's really amazing to have her and all of her knowledge come on the podcast. It was great. I know everybody's going to enjoy this episode with Dr. Mia Geisinger. Well, listeners, welcome to um, a great interview. I know it's going to be a wonderful one. It's the one that you guys asked for. You in a survey told us you wanted more perio, and so we we brought one of the best on. Welcome, Dr. Mia Geisinger. How are you? I'm so well and so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Of course. I'm so excited that you said yes. I was like, yeah, well, if people want perio, let's go to Dr. (laughs) Mia. (laughs) So um, so tell us a a little bit about who you are and what you're doing. So I am a professor of periodontology and a board certified periodontist at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. I'm also the director of the Advanced Education in Periodontology program here, so residents. And I am currently the secretary treasurer of the American Academy of Periodontology and a member of the board of the ADA Science and Research Institute. So I spend a lot of time kind of dissecting the science, uh, in particular in my areas of interest of um, the periosystemic link and overall oral wellness promotion and uh, regeneration of lost tissues due to periodontal disease. Uh, So you're not busy at all. They keep me out of trouble, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love uh, another woman who eats, breathes, and lives for dentistry. It's so lovely. So I know, like, let's just, I guess, jump into it um, around perio. I initially asked how you feel about chatting hygienists struggling with referring to the perio program or periodontist. And I would love just to kind of go to the basics of like, I don't know, where's a good place do you think to start with this conversation? I should ask since you are the, yeah, I mean, the queen I, of I it. Think, I think this is such an important question, not just referral, but also thinking about stratifying patients as far as their risk profiles. And I think that when we think about our patients, one of the really impactful things that we now have in our armamentarium as far as um, diagnosis and communication is the 2017 AAPEFP um, World Workshop on Diseases and Classification because it really talks about periodontal disease from the staging side as a continuum from stage one to stage four, but also on the risk of disease progression side 
in that grade A to grade C category. So it, it really allows us to have a more robust conversation about risk assessment for patients, what some of those risk factors systemic and local may be. Um, and then also allows us to really talk to patients about the progressive and chronic nature of periodontal disease. Um, and everybody can sort of count one, two, three, four, so they understand, you know, stage one is a better place to diagnose and treat than stage four. And that if we leave this disease untreated, the chances are that it will progress and the likelihood of the rapidity of that progression really has to do with the, the grading. So I think one of the things I always talk to people about is when I think about sort of the division between let's say cases that can be treated with non-surgical therapy alone and cases that we know are going to need advanced care, um, surgical intervention or other advanced interventions, we can really draw a line down the middle of that staging chart between the stage one and stage twos and stage three and stage fours. And we know for sure that all of those three and fours, without intervention, those individuals are likely to continue to have significant deterioration uh, I think the, the narrative in the, um, the World Workshop papers talk about stage three as likely to lose teeth without intervention and stage four as likely to lose their dentition without intervention. And, you know, when you think about it as being that significant, that severe, it's very easy to draw kind of a red line and say those are the patients that very quickly need to be identified and need to be referred. And the same thing in the grading um, scenario, those grade C patients, Patients, even if they're in the early stages, if they're grade C, if they've demonstrated a really quick change in how fast their disease is progressing or they have risk factors like um, uncontrolled blood sugar or uh, smoking, um, significant amounts of smoking that put them in that higher risk categories, those are patients that need a more aggressive approach to treatment and may benefit from higher levels of care. Now, where that care is provided, I think, you know, we all just have to be honest with ourselves and say, um, are we able to provide specialist level care? And if we're not, then those patients should be referred to a specialist. Um, if we're in any aspect of dentistry. Uh, I have patients who, when I put an implant in, will say, Doc, can you restore it? And I always answer that question by saying, I think I can, but I don't think you want me to because I haven't done it in 20 years. <laughs> so, you know, you got to be honest with yourself and say, is this something you think you can or something you know you can? And oh, that's so good. <laughs> I, th I think, you know, we all can kind of make that determination and, and it takes self-awareness and it also takes, you know sort of a thought about what do you like to do? What is what is the best and highest use of your time? Another example I always give is I can take out third molars. I have done it before, I can. But if it's gonna take my oral surgery colleague down the hall 15, 20 minutes to take out that impacted third and it's gonna take me an hour, where is the patient better served? And mm. so I don't take out impacted, non-erupted third molars because I don't feel that it's in the best interest of the patient. Oh, that's such a good breakdown. And, you know, one of the things that I, well, two of the things that I talked about with fellow hygienists um, when, because my first 15 years of my career was in a perio practice. Like that's, I graduated hygiene school and went straight into a perio implant driven surgical practice. And when I would meet other hygienists out in the world, there was a little bit of a stigma around hygienists that worked in perio practices because they thought we thought we were better. And like, what's the difference? I can do everything you're doing. And it took me a while to really kind of focus in or like discern down to like what is actually what I am doing differently. And I'm curious if this is, if, if it was just my, I think well, hopefully it wasn't just my experience, but if it, if it's maybe the majority of the experiences, um, I did less scaling and root planing as a perio hygienist because a lot of them were done at a general practice and they weren't healing. And so they were sent to the perio practice after, which really kind of screwed over the patient because now there were some areas that I needed to repeat and their benefits had already been used up. And now they were having to pay out of pocket and they were really upset by that. 
a lot of them needed probably a, a more aggressive approach, maybe like a laser uh, to treat them. And they had already used their benefits, so they were paying out of pocket. And we could have had a better outcome if they had come to us sooner. And I also have a lot more tools. Like I have all the Gracie after fives and the diamond scalers and the ultrasonic tips that are readily changed and right lefts. I had all of those things and the half of the people I talked to did not. But the big one, and this is what I love about the new classifications, is it was around bleeding. Mm -hmm. They, you did not pass go, you did not collect your $200. If I probed <laughs> and there was a bleeding point, that was like red flag, think we gotta like what's going on is this a home care thing was it your mother-in-law was in town for the holidays and you were you know living the life of the holiday season and things got a little crazy and you're here january 3rd and okay let's home care we'll see you in a few weeks we'll get right on top of that again but if not then what's our next step we're not playing around and i love that the classifications focus so heavily on bleeding points would you agree with that Yes. And actually, um, I, I would, uh, <laughs> I don't know if I can take credit for it, but that was my group when I was part of the classification. Cheers to you was on that. The, the <laughs> um, periodontal health and gingivitis section. And we spent a lot of time discussing, you know, endpoints of therapy. And realistically, that a four millimeter pocket that bleeds, even if the rest of the mouth appears okay is not an acceptable outcome of therapy and and what the literature says about how disease progression occurs when you see that type of presentation particularly if the the site had previously been quiescent so i think yes paying attention to the signs and symptoms of clinical inflammation is critically important and the example i use with our students um, and I apologize for all the podcast list listeners who can't see me doing this, but I'll hit my, my hand or my wrist and I'll say, healthy tissue should not bleed when you strike it. So if, if your gums only bleed when you floss them or your gums only bleed when you brush your teeth, that's a problem because healthy tissue should not bleed when you strike it. And so um, that intact epithelium should not result in bleeding. And the ulcerated surface of a patient who has what we would consider stage two, grade B, um, periodontitis generalized is approximately the size of the palm of a patient's hand or the surface area of a golf ball. So if you had an ulcerated lesion the size of a golf ball someplace else on your body, you would go to the doctor and say, I have a non-healing ulcer. What is wrong with me? How can I fix it? So, I mean, mm -hmm. I think that's always very important to visualize um, and to help patients visualize that if they're seeing bleeding, if there's blood in the sink, that means that something else is going on as well. You know, that is such a great um, description. And it's actually... It's not the exact description, but I was trying to explain to a nurse one time what periodontal uh, therapy was. And eventually I got to a point and I was like, it's wound management. It's, it's wound management. And a nurse, she was like, ding, 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 got it. And I was like, oh my gosh, I need to start describing it as wound management because of a disease process. And, so and it's a little bit it. more complicated yes. because our <laughs> physician colleagues, right? They are like, well, if it's bacterial related, why can't they just take an antibiotic? And you're like, no, no, it's biofilm Film. people. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a mixed bacterial infection. They can't take an antibiotic. You have to mechanically disrupt that biofilm. Um, and it's, you know, it's shocking that, you know, we're, we're in some ways so disconnected from the rest of medicine. And realistically, the mouth is a really unique place in the body because it's the only place in the body you have living hard tissue coming through an, an intact epithelial surface. And so, yes, your fingernails, yes, your hair, but all of that is dead. 
Um, and so your your teeth are are a living organ that are that are sticking through this epithelial surface. It's a really vulnerable area for this polymicrobial um, biofilm mediated immunoinflammatory response. Put that on uh, a t shirt. <laughs> I want that on a t-shirt right now. (laughs) But what a great way to describe it and explain it, um, which is, I don't think, a conversation we've had yet on this podcast about how the, we know the mouth is a difficult area. It's different than anywhere else in the body, but it's never been discussed like that. It's something that, you know, I, I struggle with when I'm working on some of these periosystemic research projects with some of my medical colleagues and just getting them on board on how this one little tiny structure, the smallest body part you can major in, right, is so unique in the whole body. My husband happens to be a physician and I once asked him, what do they teach you about teeth in medical school? (laughs) And he said, and I quote, they're the white things you look past to see the tonsils. Oh, yeah. Whereas when I was in dental school, uh, my first two years were we took every class that the medical students took, plus we took our dental anatomy and everything else on top of it. So my assumption was that at some point someone was teaching them about the teeth, but it's not necessarily the case. And oh, um, I think it it's incumbent upon us as dental healthcare professionals to really think about that and think about that as an opportunity for outreach for our patients. Um, You know, I go into grand rounds for OBGYNs. I teach in um, the new nurse midwifery program that we have here at UAB. I teach in the geriatric nursing program where we go in and we talk about, you know, here are the challenges and here are some of the ways that oral health Um, impacts our patients during these unique times of life and potentially impacts their overall health um, and some of the disease processes that they may have going on. Ah, Such a good point. So I'm curious, kind of getting back to the idea of we have a perio patient in our chair. When should we be referring to a specialist? And I know you kind of building upon the idea that Like, how does one know that it's outside of their scope at that point? So, I mean, my experience as a periodontist is fairly similar to yours in that many of the cases I get are cases where non-surgical therapy was um, performed outside of my office and or the patient had regular prophylactic cleanings, Q6 months, for a very long time while disease progression was occurring. And it's some of the hardest conversations I have to have, you know, when the patient walks in with seven and eight millimeter pockets and says, how long has this been going on? Why didn't anyone send me here? And, you know, so my, my feeling always is if the totality of the, the treatment is really going to be restricted to non-surgical therapy, those stage one and stage two patients where we think hopefully that we can achieve a resolution of the, the disease and get them back to periodontal health on a reduced periodontium with simply non-surgical therapy, even if that's requiring adjuncts, if those adjuncts are available and you can do high quality non-surgical therapy in your office, then that's a patient that um, retaining during the non-surgical therapy phase is, I think, appropriate. Those stage three and stage four patients, um, seeing them during the non-surgical therapy phase, as well as at least an alternating maintenance, is really, really helpful to me because I can surveil those patients. And then I get a lot of information during non-surgical therapy about what the intrabony defects look like and what my anticipated surgical 
interventions may be. Uh, when the patient is numb, I can do bone sounding. I can, um, you know, kind of plan out my surgery, particularly determining, okay, are these crater defects? Do we have vertical defects? You know, the beginning of which we can't see radiographically, but we may be able to drop in to that nice three-walled regenerable defect before it shows up on a radiograph, because according to Pritchard, we have to uh, lose 50% of our um, bone mineral content before that might show up on an x-ray. Oh, um, that is not something that I have heard or thought about in a minute. 50%. 50%, because think about those cortical plates. If both of those are yeah. there and we haven't lost them, but we have lost that that cancellous bone in between and we've got that gorgeous three wall defect that we just know we can like knock out of the park with a guided tissue regeneration, that's when I wanna see them. Not when I'm like, okay, is this a one wall defect? What are we gonna do, right? Right. Um, so for me, uh, you know, that is a real opportunity if this patient will be a surgical patient to, to prime the pump, but also to really do some intensive work on their home care and their oral hygiene so that they earn their surgery with proving to us that they can perform good oral hygiene. Um, many times when I get a patient who's had the initial phase of therapy done in someone else's office, I have to see them a couple of times because I haven't been seeing them throughout that whole time. So I don't know, did they brush their teeth in the parking lot and that's the only time this month? Or are, are we dealing with a patient who really has established a good um, r routine at home and, and can maintain the surgery that I'm going to do? Because the last thing I want to do is... Um, try to do pocket elimination uh, surgery with apically positioned flaps and remove attachment in a patient that is not going to be able to maintain that in a plaque-free or a low plaque environment moving forward. Oh, so you that. might... My advice would be if you think this is a non-surgical case, by all means, that's a case that I would start the non-surgical therapy on and go from there. Do your reevaluation. If something surprises you, then that's a patient you may want to refer. Um, but if it's a patient that you know from the get-go is a surgical patient, I would love to see that patient during the non-surgical therapy because it gives me so much information. And the last mm -hmm. thing I would say about referral and something that I think that all of us to some extent, underdiagnosed is gingival recession. Ooh, so yes. <laughs> I, I think that, you know, one of the things that we really need to think about is the quality and quantity, um, the periodontal phenotype uh, and the thickness, the position um, and the type of epithelial tissue around implants, mucosa, around teeth, gingiva that's present and what that means for a patient moving forward. You know, we predispose patients to higher rates of radicular caries, to higher rates of erosion and attrition, to loss of um, tooth structure, if we have gingival recession in those areas. And every millimeter of gingiva that we lose also represents a millimeter of bone that's not there anymore. So that is an undermining of the foundational structures of the teeth. So I would encourage people to look for that gingival recession and to talk to patients about what that means, what that means for them as far as that loss of um, gingival tissue. It's not just an aesthetic issue. It can be a real functional and disease issue. And, and I always say, you know, if, if we can, replacing the structures that are lost is always our, our number one priority. So if patients are missing enamel, then a class five composite or a restoration is the way to go. But if they're, if they're missing gingiva over their radicular surfaces, then let's see if we can replace that gingiva with functional gingival tissue that will provide a stable foundation. And in particular, if they also need restorative care, because we know a subgingival restoration when we only have mucosa or we have a patient who's had gingival recession tends to not be a stable environment without that two millimeters of attached gingival tissue. And it's a plaque uh, trap. Huge. It's a plaque trap. And also because that tissue, in my experience, I've, with patients and also somebody that had uh, 
had to have a gingival graft on my uh, lower 24, 25. <laughs> yes, you too. <laughs> I, I did too. Now, to be fair, I had to have it done on one of my maxillary premolars because I don't know if you know about periodontists. We tend to be a little type A. Stop it. What? <laughs> And I think I was white knuckling the tooth. <laughs> uh, well, I I had to have mine because I had a high frenum and I had to go back into ortho and get have orthognathic again. So they put me gave me a free gingival graft. But what I didn't notice, which was an eye opener as a hygienist, is how I had good hygiene. I obviously brushed my gingival margin there, but it bothered me. But it was normal. It was my norm. And I didn't realize how much easier and how much I didn't have to think about brushing my gingival margin until I had that tissue graft and built up that foundation. And I can't imagine yeah. with somebody that doesn't have the OCD of a, a hygienist <laughs> and, <laughs> and somebody then adding a re restoration, multiple millimeters down the root surface like it, they're just not going to be successful. It's so rare. Yeah. I mean, no one should be better at oral hygiene than you, you know? I, I, so if you can't do it, then you it's, know they're gonna it's struggle. insanity to expect our patients to be able to do it. It's so true. The other thing that I, as you were talking about, cause you, you said something around, you know, creating a surgical site that the patient's able to maintain and how important that is. And if they're just coming to you, you don't know if they just brushed right then, you know, or the, the week <laughs> of, you know, what is it called? Yeah. What is it? Hawth Hawthorns? Is it? Uh, ha yeah. Hawthorne effect. Thank it's you. basically people work on eyeball power, right? Yeah. Like I know it's coming. They're going to look at me. So I'm going to do a good job. Um, you know, one of the things that I think hygienists uh, are so good at knowing is their patients. And if you know, Nancy sits in my chair. I know that she's stressed out by her mother-in-law that comes on the holidays. Normally, this is like not her environment. Let's get you back on your home care regimen and see if we can get these areas of inflammation to shape back up. But the one thing that I think that did set me apart as a hygienist and a periodontal practice is that I was afforded the time and the tools to teach my patients home care. Like there was not, I, I could easily bring a patient back for oral hygiene instruction in four weeks, charge yeah. out for it, had a plethora of tools to choose from. And I think that that is sometimes what also sets, um, like if you don't have that ability to do that with your follow-up non-surgical, I, I might say a bold statement here, but you maybe shouldn't be doing it because it matters so much. It, it's huge. And when we think about, you know, one of the, the first courses that we do for the dental students in their very first semester in dental school, um, before they've kind of done anything tooth related, is we bring them in and we talk about the importance of oral hygiene. And the first question we ask is, what is the treatment for caries? What is the treatment for tooth decay? And someone usually says, a filling, a crown. And that's not the case. The treatment is dietary management and biofilm control, right? The treatment for periodontal disease is biofilm management, um, plaque control. So if we're talking about the two main dental diseases, dental caries and periodontal disease, and they're both related to that plaque control, if we're not teaching our patients how to do that, we're really doing them a disservice. And the students will say, well, people know how to brush, you know, they're oh, 30 yeah. years old, they mm -hmm. come in. And I say, okay. And we disclose all of them. <laughs> um, and now they're 23. I'd love to be a fly right? on the wall. <laughs> 23, young yeah. in dental school, no one should be better at oral hygiene than them, right? And the amount of plaque that's everywhere. Now, a lot of them have a permanent retainer or two. Um, but I say, who uses Superfloss? What are you using to get in between those lower teeth? Oh, I don't, I don't I don't use anything. Oh, oh, okay. Someone always has a dental implant. What do you use to clean around the dental implant? Are you using just floss or are you using something different? How do you clean it? Is it different than the, the rest of your teeth or no? Uh, they never told me that. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. Well, here we go. And if you can't do it without me teaching you how to do it, then you can't expect your patients to do it either. And realistically, you know, if I pay for golf lessons and I get to go and the golf instructor hands me a club and a ball and says, um, here you go, this is what you're going to do with this, and then never watches me swing, never stands behind me and says, okay, here's how you correct it, that's a problem. Sometimes the most important tool I have in my armamentarium is that 99 cent dollar store hand mirror so the patient can watch what we're doing, can see inside their mouth, can see what I'm seeing when I'm taking my measurements, can see what I'm seeing when I'm talking about, look, see how you have a bigger space here and a smaller space here? This is why we're giving you two different tools to use in these different areas. And this is why we think it's important. So, I mean, I, I would say that that's a critical part of everything we do. And honestly, if you're a restorative dentist and you're or your uh, dental hygienist working in a restorative practice, even if they refer every single periodontal case out, we still need to be doing that because it's still the treatment for dental caries. And so those patients with a high caries risk, if we're not monitoring their their uh, carbohydrate intake and we're not monitoring their plaque control, we're setting them up for failure too. Because nothing we do restoratively is as nice as Mother Nature did it in the first place. Let me tell you. Oh, yes. Say that louder for the people in the back <laughs> For the there. cheap seats? <laughs> yeah, for the cheap seats. Oh, yes. Um, so I'm curious, and I, I think this would be a, a, a lead us into the oral systemic link because I know that's some, a passion of yours. But how do, if I'm a hygienist and I'm working in a practice that wants to keep things in-house, how do I help push, discuss, um, promote <laughs> with my doctor or the dentist in the practice to say, can we start referring out? And then how do we refer to the, the right periodontist? So, you know, I think obviously depending on the environment and the state that you practice in, it, it makes a little bit of difference as a hygienist on how you might approach that. But I always say that if we come from the standpoint of the best interest of the patient, if the patient is centered in everything we do, then really, how do you make an argument that if you're saying, I believe that this is in the best interest of the patient, because this patient is having refractory disease, this patient has severe disease, this patient has X, Y, and Z risk factors, and I feel they need a higher level of care than I'm able to provide in this office, that becomes an argument that's hard to refute because it's not about, um, I want different instruments. It's not about, hey, I need more time. It's about, hey, this patient, because of these factors, because they have these risk factors, because they have demonstrated a higher propensity to continue to have breakdown despite the fact that they have low biofilm levels, the the fact that this patient has these these complexities i think this is a good patient for us to co-manage with a specialist in our area and um as far as how to choose a periodontist you know i the first level is generally looking at periodontists who are board certified there are many periodontists who are wonderful who are not board certified particularly those who graduated years ago when it was less common to be board certified but right now about half of periodontists are board certified so i think you are looking at at least someone who has opted to do a higher level of educational achievement and and something after their residency um, to get that board certification in periodontology and implant surgery. And then I would also say that I always think the best way to pick a specialist or the best way to pick a dentist is to ask other specialists to see their work. Ooh, so yeah. if, if you have an ended on his friend, um, <laughs> Because I refer, you know, a lot of my cases, perio endo cases, right? Or you have a lab that you work with. Those are really good folks to ask 
you know, who would you refer to? Because I think they see many, many different people's work. And so it, it becomes easier for them to judge who they feel has consistently high quality um, in, in their environment. And I would also say that sometimes, and I work in an environment where I work with many different periodontists periodontist, right? So there are five of us in my department. There are probably some patients who are better suited to my personality and some patients who are better suited to some of my colleagues' personalities. So I tend to be very good with an exacting patient. That's my favorite patient to have because once I can get them to buy in, they buy in, but I have to spend a long time kind of getting them there, right? So those, those patients are very good for me. I I'm not as good with a patient who's like, whatever you say, doc. But the the gentleman who has his office right behind me, I would say he probably prefers those patients because he's very straightforward. He's a little bit more taciturn than I am. Uh, so he, he, he likes a patient like that who will give him a little bit more leeway. Whereas I want a patient who I know when, they, when they've decided to move forward with treatment, they are all in with Their both partner. feet. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, those patients may make a different um, decision based upon just whose personality they they gel with better. And I, I do think sometimes if you're in an environment where there are more than one specialist, you do have to make a decision. This patient may be a better fit for this doc versus that doc because of their communication style. Yeah. Such a good point. And I guess moving into the real kind of reason why we are needing to look at perio more intensely, it would be, correct me if I'm wrong, the periosystemic link. So one of the um, things that I think the pandemic maybe laid bare was that if we don't have our health, there is very few other things in life that, that matter a whole heck of a lot. And, you know, in that same vein, we're really finding out that the inflammatory effects of the chronic low-grade inflammation associated with periodontitis in particular really have widespread systemic effects throughout the body. And, you know, the more we learn about this, the the more clear it is that, you know, obviously any non-acute inflammation is bad. Acute inflammation we like. It's acute. Uh, (laughs) But we like it because, I mean, obviously if we didn't have any inflammation, we'd all just be like walking around with every paper cut we ever had just oozing from every, you know, skinned knee that, that we got when we were eight years old. You need some inflammation so that you heal. But chronic inflammation is really a problem. And in fact, the WHO says uh, chronic inflammatory diseases um, are the number one risk to overall health and wellness um, throughout the globe. So when we think about, you know, what those chronic inflammatory diseases are, you know, we're talking about cardiovascular disease, cerebrovascular disease, we're talking about obesity, we're talking about diabetes mellitus, we're talking about rheumatoid diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and other autoimmune diseases. Um, And then, you know, frankly, one of the differentials that we saw with related to the heterogeneity in the reaction for patients who uh, became infected with COVID-19 was really related to some of those pre-existing conditions, and in particular, the cytokine storm, that inflammatory reaction that patients had. And in a study out of Qatar, we, we saw that patients who were hospitalized had almost a ninefold higher risk of dying from COVID-19 if they had periodontal inflammation and alveolar bone loss. So, you know, the, the, the static judges that we can have of periodontal disease. Now, that's a cross-sectional study. It doesn't show causation. But it's really important to think about a ninefold difference. That's huge. You know, all of us can affect people's overall health through their oral health by, by really 
doing a good job of diagnosing, communicating disease, and treating disease with our patients. So, mm. you know, if we think about the, those kind of impacts, not just on oral health, which oral health is important for oral health sake, but also, you know, on their short and long-term health, it's really incredible. And some of the emerging information we're seeing about cardiovascular disease, about dementias, it's, it's unbelievable. It really is, and I, I think we are. We don't sell ourselves for being how important that we are in the grand scheme of things. You know, especially hygienists, we're just cleaning teeth, and it's like, no, this is so much bigger than getting the gunk off of people's teeth. Calculus, which I will be the first and be like what's the real cause of the disease y'all like let's start focusing on that and then the byproduct of calculus kind of diminishes and we're not focusing scalar on tooth every single time they come and sit in that chair because it's so much bigger than removing calculus and stain i also now when i look back on my patients in my perio practices i think about all of the ones that had good hygiene. They were doing everything I asked them to do better than I could in my own mouth probably. (laughs) And they still struggled. And when that oral systemic and I started going to the courses, I was like, oh God, I wish I could go back and do it again with these patients because there was something systemically that was an issue that we just couldn't see at the time. And, you know, um, from the Minnesota twin studies, we know that periodontal disease is about 50% heritable. So there are patients with hyperinflammatory, you know, IL-1 genotypes or other hyperinflammatory states that may affect their disease progression. They just may be more susceptible to disease. But in those patients, potentially using targeted host immunoinflammatory modulators like low-dose doxycycline um, or aspirin and uh, omega-3 for resolving purposes may be a real option to reduce that um, that inflammatory load. You know, uh, I tell the story and it's, it's not my patient, but a patient of a colleague of mine who he's documented um, for years who happens to be an orthodontist and has clearly a fabulous oral hygiene, absolutely wonderful, but continually demonstrates bleeding, continually demonstrates attachment loss. And, you know, they've had to shorten the recall intervals and and move to a host modulation adjunct, uh, which seems to have helped. But I, I know that if this person was not a dentist, they would not have their teeth. You know, I I think that, you know, if they weren't in the dental profession, that would not be um, maybe even something that they were aware of at a young enough age to really do the types of intervention that allowed this individual to to save their teeth. So I, I think about that particular patient a lot when I think about my patients who um, for unexplained reasons come in and they have disease progression despite great oral hygiene. You know, the first thing we do is send them for, uh, you know, a systemic workup and and check some of those um, systemic inflammatory marker levels. And then um, many times they come back and they say, I've been diagnosed with this rheumatological disease or, um, you know, I my doctor's concerned about this for me. And just getting on the the straight and narrow with some of these other factors definitely impacts their mouth. You know, there's a, a really interesting study out of the Netherlands that looks at patients with rheumatoid arthritis and looks at, you know, in those patients who are taking medications that block some of the inflammatory mediators through either IL-1 blockers or TNF-alpha blockers or B-cell blockers um, and, and how their oral health is impacted after they start taking those medications. It's really interesting to see that obviously Obviously, we know that that alphabet soup is going on and all those cytokines are going on as part of this disease process. But, you know, to see how it 
it affects the the oral environment after they get um, mm-hmm. get sort of squared away with their rheumatologic di- disorders is is impactful for sure. And I, we just had a podcast on uh, Crohn's and colitis and how that affects oral health and you know how people that might manifest like it's the disease might manifest itself in oral health in oral disease before it does or before they connect the dots that it is mm-hmm. actually this digestive um inflammatory disease and I'm like oh see we're so important <laughs> <laughs> i you know i think it's really important to think about that and and think about the impacts that we can have you know um patients who are informed that uh, smoking impacts their oral health and are counseled to quit by their dentist are actually three times more likely to quit than those who are given the same information from their pulmonologist. <gasps> what? Because people don't expect their dentist to talk to them about that. Yeah. Um, and there also may be a cosmetic impact, like you can tell I smoke, which of course we can tell people smoke, but uh, <laughs> but patients are surprised by that, right? Um, and, you know, now with the advent of vaping, there's a lot of people who don't report smoking. Mm. And so I think asking specific questions about nicotine consumption via vaping is really important because, yes, it may be a risk modulator when it comes to lung cancer. But as far as periodontal disease, it's really the nicotine that is causing the vasoconstriction and causing the endothelial dysfunction that we associate with some of the wound healing issues with regard to oral disease. And so it doesn't really matter how they're taking the nicotine in. Mm. Uh, It matters, you know, that that nicotine consumption. And in fact, sometimes with vaping, they're taking more nicotine in than they would be with cigarette smoking because you can do it more places. You can do it in your office and nobody knows, right? So true. Well, as we like kind of sum up and bring this to an end, I'm curious, um, what do you think are some of the more simple conversations? Maybe the oral systemic link is not somebody, something that a hygienist feels comfortable talking about, but they, they hear the importance, they understand it. Um, where, what could they start talking about with their patients um, that's pretty simple and maybe could get them to accept periodontal treatment? So, I mean, I think about going back to our earlier conversation about what really does this disease look like? And if you talk to patients about that non-healing wound and how that could impact their overall health, right? So you have an ulcer that's facing your teeth that you can't see, but we know is there because we're taking these measurements. And that ulcerated surface area is like if you had a diabetic foot ulcer or you had necrotizing fasciitis, it's affecting your whole body. And, you know, one of the reasons why all of us in dentistry have a job is that people don't want to lose teeth. You know, teeth are still a body part. It's not just an extraction. You know, in my opinion, it's an amputation. And so we... (laughs) We are in the business of saving teeth. And when it comes down to it, that's always my goal. And so how do we talk to patients about a disease that doesn't hurt? How do we talk to patients about something that five years or 10 years down the line may necessitate an amputation? Well, it has to be the same way that other people talk about chronic diseases like hypertension, like diabetes mellitus. This is a chronic disease. And here's why it's important, because we don't want you to lose teeth. And here are the things that you can do to impact it. And those may be lifestyle changes, like, hey, let's go check your blood sugar. Let's think about quitting smoking. Um, It may be that you need to spend more time on your oral hygiene, just like people who have diabetes, you know, they're going to need to check their blood sugar more often. They're going to need to go to their doctor on a more frequent basis. Oral hygiene may be your new hobby. Uh, (laughs) I can think of worse hobbies. (laughs) I know it's not that exciting. It's the new year. Everyone's coming up with a new New Year's resolution, a new hobby anyway. But... uh, (laughs) 
But, you know, if, if we couch it like that and we talk about what the overall impacts are for our patient, what the disease process looks like and why we feel it's important and why we're spending time, why we care about that patient, and then follow that up with sort of solid, concrete steps that they can take to improve their oral hygiene in addition to the interventions that we are going to do. Because doing those interventions ourselves, whether it be non-surgical or surgical therapy, without that long-term follow-up, without that maintenance, without that uh, oral hygiene at home, you know, is a half measure at best. And, you know, one of the things that we saw and I'm sure you saw it in the pandemic, was those patients who missed one or two or three or four maintenance intervals and came back and all of a sudden, you know, it was it was a whole different ball game on what we were looking at as far as disease severity and disease progression. I shouldn't say it made me feel good, but in some respects it did because I felt Validated. like this is why we're doing this. Yeah. I don't, I'm not, do, I'm not seeing you every three months because I, I have a boat payment to make. <laughs> right. I'm, seeing, I'm seeing you every, which I, I don't want a boat, but, uh, <laughs> but I'm seeing you every three months because this is what it takes at your level of disease to keep you healthy. That prophy, that prophylaxis, that's a preventative measure. That's what prophylaxis means, right? So, if you already have disease, a prophylaxis is no longer appropriate because we're not preventing disease. You are always more susceptible to breakdown. So even that patient who has a periodontal health on a reduced periodontium in a periodontitis patient, in the presence of inflammation, that patient is always going to be more susceptible to breakdown because their attachment apparatus is different than the attachment apparatus of someone who has an intact periodontium. So those patients we need to surveil and we need to monitor on a more frequent basis. And the last thing I would say is none of us are any good without good data coming in. Mm. So the best thing we can do is gather the best data we can. And that means when we're doing our comprehensive exams, we're taking measurements that are accurate and appropriate. We're monitoring for that bleeding upon probing. We're monitoring for plaque scores. And we're also looking at gingival recession, both positive and negative, um, you know, gingival overgrowth and gingival recession, where we can get an accurate assessment of what the overall clinical attachment levels are, what those probing depths are, and and what the the entire picture for our patients is. Um, taking appropriate radiographs is critically important. Uh, and thinking about, you know, how then do we use that data to make sure that we're making an accurate diagnosis and risk assessment for our patients. So, you know, I think we have to be thorough with those data that we're collecting and then we have to know how to use it and how to communicate <laughs> that the the um the diagnoses that we're making to our patients in a way that feels accessible um and feels like they can make a change that they can impact um in a positive way their disease and and hopefully keep their teeth which is really the name of the game right oh, so true well, I just want to say thank you. That was all fabulous information, fabulous suggestions. And I, gosh, I, I couldn't agree more with the data. The, the amount of times that I go into an office and there's no full mouth probing, there's no clinical attachment levels, there's no bleeding points, there's no furcation documentation. I, I'm just dumbfounded. But I also grew up, quote unquote, my entire career until I went into um, public health and restorative. And I was like, this isn't, this isn't what y'all do. What? <laughs> Wait, what? Who, who does it then? <laughs> where, where you get this yeah. information? And, and the flip side is as a perianonist, I need to be looking for caries, you know, so true. I, right. I can't let that slide by the wayside either. So, exactly. you know, I'm still a dentist first. And, you know, if we're talking about, what are the things that we need to be looking for? Oral cancer screening at every visit. Yep. Caries and periodontal disease. If you can do those three things, you got about 90% of it covered. 
Right. You know, everything else is kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> and everything you know, else is not something somebody else will deal with, like sleep apnea yeah. and tongue ties and stuff. Like those are just the, the nuances of a human that you then have to open your eyes to, but it's not everybody. And, and you know, I think it's, it's fabulous to be screening for those things. And for our three month patients that come in every three months, we, we switch, um, a sort of disease or condition we're screening for. So whether it is sleep apnea, whether we do a ADA American Diabetes Association screening tool um, that they fill out in the waiting room that looks at risks for prediabetes and diabetes, whatever it is, we're screening for those things kind of on an ongoing annual basis. But at every appointment, if I'm doing those three oral diseases, right. let's do it. Yeah, that's so good. Well, I would love for you to tell everybody where I'm sure they learned so much from you and they're going to want to pick up an article, take a course. Where can they find you? Oh, goodness. Um, well, let's see. Uh, Google you your can... name for one because there's so much there. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can always get a hold of me. You can send me an email. I'm M-I-A-G-D-D-S at UAB.edu. You can follow me on Instagram at, at M-I-A-G-D-D-S. Um, I always like to post my little inspirational uh, quotes or links to some interesting articles or tea things that I find there. Uh, it's real dentistry heavy, fortunately or unfortunately, I don't know. Uh, occasionally you get a glimpse at my family, but mostly it's teeth. Uh, um, uh, you know, and, and I would say um, I have some courses available with DACE, with dentalcare.com. Uh, um, there are some through Densply Academy that you can take a peek at. And um, I'm speaking at different uh, dental conventions. I'd love to see you at any of our upcoming um, upcoming talks. Um, and if there's something I can answer for you, or if you have a question, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, I like to be a resource if I can. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time and your expertise and uh, for sharing this discussion with us. Thank you for having me, Michelle. I really appreciate it. Awesome.